Every now and then, you hear something about El Nino, or less often and notoriously, La Nina. Maybe you've heard it has something to do with hot water in the Pacific. Or was it cold water? Either way, it sounds kind of important, so what is it? The ocean is responsible for just about all of Earth's climate. Changes in the ocean always coincide with a change in the climate. The larger the change, the greater the impact. Not only is the ocean responsible for Europe's mild winter climate, but it can also have visible effects. Notice any similarities between these continents? There's a desert on the western coast for each one. This isn't a coincidence. This is due to ocean currents depositing colder water at these shorelines. These colder waters mean less moisture in the air and thus a drier climate. Since an ocean's temperature is essential in dictating the climate nearby, it should come as no surprise that if El Nino is a change in ocean temperature, it should have an impact on climate. Let's figure out why. The first thing to comprehend is the basic principles of fluids. Despite fluid dynamics being an extremely computationally intensive area of mathematics, it still follows two simple rules as long as the fluid isn't bounded by a container. One, hotter fluids are less dense or have a lower pressure. And two, fluids move from high pressure to low pressure. So if you change the temperature somewhere in a fluid system, you'll completely change the flow or behavior of that fluid. In large bodies of water, like lakes and the ocean, the top layers are constantly warmed by the sun. This warmth penetrates a specific depth, so we can expect all water in this region to more or less maintain a constant temperature with slight variations with depth and the amount of sun. This means any water below this line will probably be cooler or denser than the water above it, and thus can't properly rise to mix and absorb its warmth. This separation compounds, and you get a very noticeable delineation between warmer water and cooler water. This is called the thermocline. The thermocline is the most important factor in regards to El Nino. Keep that in mind. Let's look at how the Pacific Ocean normally behaves. We have colder water over here, which cools the air and thus increases the atmospheric pressure. We have warmer water over here, which warms the air and creates low atmospheric pressure. As one would expect, the air flows from high to low pressure. Normally, there should be no reason for this temperature imbalance. But since the thermocline is important, that probably has an impact. The wind caused by this difference in pressure tugs on the ocean via friction, creating surface currents. As the water displaces to the west, it needs to be replaced, so water from below rises to do so. Here's where our thermocline comes into play. The thermocline in the east is very shallow, less than 50 meters deep. The surface currents created by the wind affect roughly the top 50 meters of water. That means the water that rises to replace it comes from below the thermocline. That is to say, it's very cold. This keeps our surface temperature cold and keeps our pressure gradient and subsequently the wind strong and active. Because the water generally always moves westward and pools up there, the western thermocline is very deep, causing the surface temperature there to remain warm. So as long as the eastern waters stay cold, things progress normally. El Nino, therefore, is the phenomenon of the eastern Pacific failing to remain cool. But what we have here is a positive feedback loop. Sure, El Nino is the warming of the eastern, but why does this happen? What breaks this positive feedback loop? What I'm about to present could change in 50 years as computers improve. Because despite fluids being very simple, calculating and modeling them accurately is very difficult, and it gets exponentially harder as the scale increases. So when talking about the scale of the Pacific, yeah, it's kind of hard to be sure our models are accurate. But what do we think is happening? Earlier, I mentioned there's no reason for the west to be warmer than the east. Both points are along the equator and receive the same amount of light. So how does this imbalance occur? Any fluid on a rotating sphere, like Earth, is affected by the sphere's rotation. This manifests in lateral motions we call Rossby waves. If we imagine a distribution of particles along a single longitude of Earth, we can compare their relative rotation in space compared to their rotation along the normal axis. On the equator, 100% of the rotation is on the y-axis, and none along the normal. 
whereas in the poles, 100% of the rotation is along the normal. If we compare the relative rotation along the normal axes, we can see that water particles rotate faster as you move away from the equator. What's this mean? Well, any water that moves slightly away from the equator will encounter faster rotating water particles that will push them to the west, opposite as one would expect from the Coriolis force. This push to the west creates our Rossby waves and thus we get the start of how our Pacific should look. As this water travels west, it starts building up and pushing down the thermocline, which is a criteria needed to keep the western Pacific warm. These arriving Rossby waves also reflect off the western coast and begin their journey back east as what we call a Kelvin wave. But the Kelvin wave is of lesser impact than the Rossby waves as the Rossby waves are soon reinforced by easterly wind flows. Rossby and Kelvin waves can be detected at the ocean surface, but they are only roughly 10 centimeters in height. However, in the thermocline, these waves can cause fluctuations of up to 100 meters huge variations in thermocline depth. Now we've reached the disputed part of our El Nino. What causes the tipping point? We've seen how Rossby waves can create warm water buildup in the west, which pushes down the thermocline, keeping the water warm. This warmth creates a low pressure region, which causes winds to blow from east to west. This wind brings more water and also helps amplify the cool surface water in the east, thus continuing the cycle. So how do we break this positive feedback loop? There are two main theories. The first is that there is a natural oscillation between buildup of warm water in the west, followed by reflection of waves to the east. This reflection then pushes down the thermocline as it goes and warms the ocean's surface. This oscillation can be affected by noise or interactions with the atmosphere. There's also a more stable yet stochastic model which suggests that this buildup of warm water in the west is a stable state as long as the winds and currents holding it there are maintained. But of course nature isn't constant and eventually there will be some disruption in wind flow and currents or slip as I like to visualize it. This slip causes the warm water volume to destabilize and discharge from the western pacific. There is decent correlation between strong westerly wind events and the initiation of Nino events. These strong winds push the warm water east, starting the discharge. The produced Kelvin waves then flow to the east, lowering the thermocline as they travel, while subsequently raising the thermocline in the west. This model is a bit more attractive as it can explain how or why Nino events have different timings and variabilities in strengths. But both models look rather similar and perhaps they are one and the same. Only stronger computing power may tell us for sure. Because of the redistribution of the warm water and change in the equatorial thermocline, we have a reversal in ocean temperatures. Warmer in the east, cooler in the west. And since ocean temperatures affect climate, we see drastic changes in the climate in the east and west. As this warm water reaches the east, it collides with the American coast, dispersing to the north and the south. These changes in temperature affect not only ocean currents, but atmospheric currents too. We aren't quite sure how and to what extent it does, but someday we may be able to explain how exactly El Nino causes climate impacts all over the globe. After an El Nino event, the warm water content in the equatorial Pacific is drained and thus the process starts over. Lastly, as a quick addendum, I should mention that the scientific community has agreed on the existence of two Nino events, those in the east like we are familiar with, and those that occur over the middle of the Pacific and are further from human observation. The mechanisms and atmospheric interactions are basically the same, but it appears that their occurrence is becoming more common as sea temperatures rise. It's still not quite certain how this will play into global weather patterns in the future, but it's certainly something of interest to keep an eye on. And that's hopefully a good explanation of what causes an El Nino event. <laughs>